So we have talked about nervous tissue, so we know all the details of the cells that make up our nervous system, right? All the good stuff. We've talked about myelin. We've talked about signal conduction. Now we're going to talk about um, the central nervous system and then go into details of the peripheral nervous system. So it's kind of the same stuff we've been talking about, but we're going to add some more detail to it. Okay, and we're going to start with the central nervous system. Um, today we're going to touch on the spinal nerves, sorry, the spinal cord, and then a little bit of spinal nerves. And then on Thursday, we'll finish off the spinal nerves and then jump right into that lovely um, cerebral hemispheres and the reflexes next week. All right, so uh, what are we gonna do? We're gonna look at the anatomical features of the spinal cord and spinal nerves. We're gonna look at the functions of the spinal cord. Um, and those spinal nerves, and then understand spinal reflex arcs, but we're gonna do the reflex arcs on Thursday, not today. Okay, so basically, the functions of, of, spinal functions of the spinal cord. So remember, you had your brain, right? This is your brain, this is your brain on drugs. And then <laughs> the spinal cord extends down from the brain, traveling through that vertebral foramen that was in those vertebrae that we took in AMP1 lab, remember, that we all hated. So it travels right down through that opening all the way down. It begins at the end of the brain stem, which if you've already done lab, that would have been the end of the medulla today, right? And then extends all the way until about L1 or L2. L refers to the lumbar area, lumbar vertebrae. So your lumbar vertebrae one or lumbar vertebrae two. So just looking at the anatomical um, image of it, you can imagine that the spinal cord is what connects your entire body to this big guy right here, okay? So not only are there spinal nerves coming off of the spinal cord in between each and every vertebrae, you have spinal nerves. You also have, I forgot what I was gonna say. Okay, I'm sorry, y'all. Yesterday I was not medicated, and that was the roughest class I've ever taught. I don't even know what I talked about because I had run out of my medication, and it was me on hyper ADD, and I don't think we got anything done. But today I'm medicated, so it's gonna go good. Okay, so <coughs> you have spinal nerves coming off on either side, pairs of spinal nerves in between those vertebrae, innervating your entire body, your spinal cord takes in all of that sensory information and sends it to the brain, and then it takes those instructions from the brain and sends it back out to the body. So it is like the main pathway or connection for your entire body to your brain, okay? So we also have something called a reflex arc. What is that? That was that example of where I put my hand in the campfire. Remember when we started doing spinal cord in, the, in lab and I put my hand in the campfire? I had the burning sensation that went to my spinal cord and then it immediately went to a motor neuron to tell me to move my hand physically out of the fire, right? That's a reflex arc. It's something that happens at the level of the spinal cord because it is a reflex. It does not, um, it does eventually go to the brain, yes, but it doesn't have to go immediately. And we'll talk about those in a little bit. Um, so spinal cord, Reflex arcs integrates all of my action potentials, whether they're exciting or inhibiting, it's going to integrate everybody, put them where they're supposed to be, um, send them up in a track or send them down in a track. So it kind of sorts everyone as they're coming into the brain, tells everybody where they need to be, make sure that um, they all have their own pathway to go up into uninterrupted. And then it's going to take all of my sensory impulses to the brain, and then bring back all of my motor impulses from the brain, okay? So really the spinal cord is like the organizational um, stem to the brain. Does it all. Okay, let's look at it anatomically. I'm just gonna remind you, the central nervous system is made up of the brain and the spinal cord. Everything else is the peripheral nervous system. 
So you have nerves that come off of the brain, uh, off of the hemispheres themselves called cranial nerves. Those are peripheral nervous systems. You have nerves coming off of the spinal cord called spinal nerves. Those are also peripheral nervous systems. The brain and the spinal cord are the only parts of the central nervous system. Like I just mentioned earlier, the spinal cord begins from the medulla, travels through the vertebral canal, that's that opening in those vertebrae, and then ends between the first and second lumbar vertebrae, that it's L1 and L2, somewhere around there. Um, just a little reminder, we talked about this in lab, but let's talk about it again, our gray matter and white matter. We know that gray matter, remember, was our evil gray butterfly, and the white matter was the white sand dollar. Well, what's inside of there? Because we didn't really talk about the details of inside. In your gray matter, you're going to find cell bodies of those neurons. You're also going to find dendrites, axons, and neuroglia. When you look at axons, keep in mind those are unmyelinated axons. Unmyelinated. Because remember, it's gray. Okay? The white matter, less stuff. The white matter is my myelinated axons, and then you will find a few neuroglia in there, okay? So if this confuses you, just remember the white matter is myelinated axons, gray matter is everything else, right? Yeah, okay, good deal. All right, so obviously the spinal cord is part of the central nervous system. It is essential for our bodies to function properly, so we do have to protect it. Just like the brain, the spinal cord is protected on the very outside by bone. And what would that be? Your vertebrae, right? And then you will have three layers of connective tissue coverings called meninges. We're going to talk about those three layers in the, in the minute. We talked about them in lab today, but the very outside one is your dura. The middle one is your arachnoid. And then the innermost one is the pia. Those are the meninges. It's connective tissues that cover the entire brain and spinal cord. And then we also have fluid. So the bone protects on the very outside. Then you have three layers of connective tissue and embedded into those layers of connective tissue is a fluid called cerebrospinal fluid or you can call it CSF. And CSF bathes the entire brain and spinal cord. It almost sort of floats in this watery chamber so that there's no pressure on it and it's not pushed up against that bone. It's nice and airy because it's got this like water bed that it sits in all the time. Okay, and that is our CSF, and we will talk about um, how CSF is made, filtered, and maintained later on um, in the same unit. Any questions here? Okay, awesome. Okay, and over here on the picture, you can see a cross section of the spine. So this is a vertebrae right here. That's actually a body body of a vertebrae. Here is your spinal cord right here. Okay. Now the pia matter is stuck to it really closely. You can't actually um, see it too well, but we did get to peel it off today for a little bit. And then you have your dura matter is this thick outer one here in between the two, oops, in between the two is the arachnoid, which is really um, soft and web-like, right? We didn't even get a chance to, to isolate it in the lab today. And then um, you're going to have your fluid with that arachnoid. I do want you to notice how this is kind of cool, how you see the spinal cord, and then look right here. That is the nerve. There's your spinal nerves leaving the vertebral column, and that's exactly how they do it in between those bones. They come out and then begin innervating the entire body. Okay. Details of those meninges. So what were my three coverings first? I had bone, I had the meninges, and then I had CSF, right, that's my three levels of protection for the brain and the spinal cord. Now, the meninges that were there, we had the dura matter, that was the outermost one today in lab, that was that white, tough connective tissue that you took off of the brain. Below that is the arachnoid matter, that's a thin uh, web-like middle layer. 
And then the innermost layer that's stuck right onto the brain is the pia matter. That's your deepest one. Okay, and you can see them over here in this picture. The dura matter is white. That's this white covering here. Your arachnoid is this, I don't even know if that's pink or purple, maybe light lavender. And then the pia is the innermost one right here. That is like a peachy pink color. And then this is super cool because you can see how these spinal nerves come out. Um, and you'll notice that they actually have two different roots. There's one here, a posterior one, and there's a root here, an anterior one. Those two roots will join to give you a spinal nerve. That is cool, right? Ah, okay. Any questions on our layers? Because we're going to talk about the spaces between them now. No? Okay. So in addition to that connective tissue coverings, those three meningi meningeal layers, we also have some spaces that we need to be able to define. The very first one is epidural. What does epi mean? Outside. Right. So epidural is that space between the dura and bone. Epidural. Have you ever heard that word before? Absolutely. All the girls are like, yes, we all know about it. But the guys are like, no, we've never heard this before. Unless, you have, unless you've had someone who's had a baby and you were in the room with them and they were trying to talk her into getting an epidural injection, maybe. Okay, so that should tell you right away there's a little light bulb that went off. And okay, so epidural space is between dura and bone. That means when you go to have a baby and you get an epidural injection and they inject that two foot long needle into your spine, they're actually just trying to get to that space between the dura and the bone. Yes, when you hunch over like that, they try to separate those vertebrae to have enough space to get in between the bones. So remember your vertebrae are stacked on top of each other. And they have to go in through that. And that is exactly why I have never had one and will never have one. Also why most people who have had an epidural suffer with severe back issues later on. Because guess what? You're still poking a two foot needle through your spine. <laughs> Sorry, I'm bad. I'm so bad. Yeah, no, I saw it being done one time and I was like, oh no, never. But I also did, I do remember my first labor too. And I was like, oh, hell no, I'm never having a child. I'm not doing that to my body. And I did it three times. Um, but the epidural I was able to stick with and not do because I don't like needles that much. Um, and I just didn't want that going into my back. It's a nightmare. So. Mm -hmm. It is. Have you done it? Yeah, did it work the you had one too? Did it work the first time or did it Yeah, it's terrifying to be awake and be like numb. And, I don't know. For me it's, it was the needle. That's all it took. I didn't even have to see it being done. I just saw the needle come out and I was like, yeah, no. Not not going to happen. No, I saw it like, I, like my first epidural was probably about like maybe eight, yeah, eight or nine, shoot, even 10, maybe 10 years before um, my, my first child was born. And it, it affected me that long that I was able to say no. And I went to the hospital in labor and they were like, oh, we still have time for an epidural. And I was like, oh, hell no, not doing it. And they just kept trying to talk me into it. And I'm like, I'm not going to do it. I don't care. They're like, but the pain. And I was like, you can drug me. It's fine. I will be, I would rather be put down completely and not have that needle in my back. It's not going to happen. And, and so <laughs> they just kept trying, trying. And then eventually I got to the point, they're like, okay, we can't do anything about it now. So you're going to have to push. <laughs> I was like, yeah, okay. Anyways, that's your epidural space between the dura, that outer covering and the bone. And that's where that needle needs to go into to make sure you inject that anesthetic all around the spinal cord, but it doesn't actually pierce um, the dura or the spinal cord. It's only meant to be just outside of it. Okay. 
And then we have a subdural space that obviously sub that word, what does that mean? Below, right? Sub is below. Nobody knew sub was below? Like sub-level, submarine, not the sub sandwich. Maybe it is, I don't know why they called it a sub, but yeah. So sub is below. So the space below the dura would be the space between the dura and the arachnoid. That's your subdural space. Why is that important? Well, let's talk about it. The arachnoid is very vascular. The subdural space is a spot that we will see a lot of things um, called hematomas, where you have a brain bleed, right? So what you end up with is bleeding under the dura between the arachnoid and the dura, and that ends up putting pressure, because now, remember, the dura is a tough, white, really tough tissue, and it's completely enclosing the brain. So when you have a bleed under it, that's going to put pressure on the brain tissue, because there's nowhere for that blood to go. To, to be absorbed. It's not like you cut your finger and you're bleeding it to the outside, you're bleeding on the inside. So that is a subdural um, hematoma that happens in the subdural space. Okay. And then we have a subarachnoid space. So that would tell me that it is below the arachnoid. Yes, it is. In between the arachnoid and the pia is the subarachnoid space. And that space is important because that's where our cerebrospinal fluid is circulating. Okay, all right, so three spaces you do need to know. Epidural between the dura and bone, subdural just below the dura between it and the arachnoid, and subarachnoid between um, the arachnoid and the pia is where um, that CSF is flowing. Okay, so we know that the spinal cord is going to start. I'm just gonna do a little picture right here. There's our brain, there's our brain stem. Then you have your spinal cord, and it stops at the level of L1 to L2. Well, what happens after it stops? You end up that blunt end, oops, that end of it is called a conus medullaris because it looks like a cone, but then you still have some spinal nerves that are coming out, and they will just kind of look like that. They just come right off of that cone. Somebody looked at that and said that looks like a horse's tail and called the very end of the spinal cord a cauda equina, cauda equina, horse's tail, right here, cauda equina. Okay, so those are the, the those are the, <laughs> I combined spinal and bundle. Those are the spinal nerves that come off of the very last part of the spinal cord. Any questions on this? No? Okay, and your spaces are labeled here. Uh, your subdural right here between the dura and the arachnoid, your subarachnoid between the arachnoid and the pia, and then um, your epidural would be the air, would be out here, epidural between the bone and the dura. Okay. All right. All right, so you guys are super familiar with this one, right? Because we did it in lab and we sat here and we memorized the whole thing, right? Yes. So the only thing I'm going to talk about right here is I kind of want to circle back. And I know we did this in lab, but we're going to do it again right here where you have this blue sensory neuron bringing in a sensation um, and then relaying. What does it do? Because this is the reflex arc and I want to talk about it for a minute. So in blue right here, this neuron is a sensory neuron that is connected to a receptor that's bringing in a sensation. Um, it goes into the spinal cord. Notice we're in the butterfly now, so we're in the gray butterfly. It's going to relay onto an interneuron that takes that signal to this red neuron here, which happens to be a motor neuron. So if I put my hand in the campfire here, that signal of burning, and then this sensory nerve go, goes ahead and relays it right to a motor neuron to say, move your hand. Notice this didn't have to go up to the brain for something to happen, okay? Um, and so that is what we call a reflex arc. It's where the spinal cord kind of takes care of something on its own without asking the brain for input. Does it send a report to the brain? Yes, it does send it to the brain to be associated with other things and also to be remembered and to be interpreted and all the good stuff that our cerebral cortex does. So it does go to the brain, 
but it's taken care of immediately as a reflex on this level first. So this is kind of like um, if you had a classroom with a teacher and there's a student that's acting up and the teacher takes him and disciplines him right, you know, right then and there, puts him in timeout or whatever. Okay, so if I'm the teacher and Erica bit, <laughs> just saying, Erica bit Trinity, I will remove Erica, discipline her, right? Put her in timeout or whatever and take care of Trinity. Am I gonna tell the principal? Yes, I will. I will file an accident report or whatever report. I'm gonna write up the child, but I have to solve this before I, have to, I can do anything else. That's what a reflex arc is. It's where that spinal cord, wake up. You're making me sleep. Both of you. Y'all, I'm sorry. I know it's boring. I know anatomy is boring, but I promise it's going to be a short class. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, it's where the spinal cord takes care of those emergency things, those reflexes, before it even has to send it to the brain. Okay, so that's what a reflex arc is. I just wanted to touch on that because we're going to talk about details of reflexes later on. Not today, though, thank God. But later on, on Thursday. <laughs> Maybe it's the weather. I don't know. But I'm, I keep getting louder. I'm so loud. Any questions on how this works? Maybe no? Okay. And then I do want to point out one other thing that we didn't do in lab right here. Notice that you have roots. This is a anterior root. This is a posterior root. The two will merge to give me a spinal nerve right there. And this is happening on both sides in between each and every vertebrae. Okay? All right. Not even going to do this one because you guys already know all this. Any questions on that? Remember the evil gray butterfly, the white sand dollar. We know everything that's going on. And now to add to that, we know that in this white matter here is only myelinated axons and some neuroglia. And then all of the other stuff is in this evil gray butterfly. You've got your cell bodies, you have unmyelinated axons, you have neuroglial cells in there, right? Okay. Okay, so sensory and motor processing that happens at the level of the spinal cord is the exact same thing we just talked about, but I'm gonna add a little bit more to it. So going into the spinal cord over here, that is all of our sensory neurons, picking up all of these little bits of information from all of their receptors, whether it's mechanoreceptors, chemoreceptors, pressure receptors, all of them. It all goes into the spinal cord. Once it gets into the spinal cord, and this is that integration uh, part of the spinal cord. This is where the spinal cord says, okay, you are a sensation that needs to go up on this side of the spinal cord, so we're going to send you up here. Okay, you're, you need to cross over to the other side and go up in the other elevator, so you go up in this one. Oh, you're a motor. You need to be relayed to a motor neuron immediately. You're a reflex. We're going to send you over here to be relayed onto a motor neuron. That's what the spinal cord does. It takes in everything and sorts it out. It says, okay, you cross over to the left side, or no, you stay on this side and you go up in this elevator, you go over there and go up in the other one, okay? That's the whole purpose of our spinal cord. And when it does that, when it sorts these neurons out and tells them where to go up where, we call those tracks. So those elevators that they're traveling up and down in are called tracks. So we have motor tracks going down, oops, we have sensory tracks going up, motor tracks going down. And they really do function just like elevators. So the sensory track that's ascending will come over here and go up to the brain or the cortex. If it's something that has to cross over to the other side, it would cross over here and then go up to the brain, right? These are all ascending. Ascending sensory tracts, meaning the elevator's going up, goes to the brain, the brain decides what to do, sends it back in a descending motor tract, meaning I'm now going to a motor neuron and I'm going to cause something to happen, something to move or some action. So in any section of that spinal cord, you're going to find different tracts that are either ascending or descending. Those are your elevators. 
I'm not going to even ask you to memorize these tracks, okay? But I do want you to know that that's what the spinal cord does. It organizes everybody, sends them to which elevator they need to go to, okay? All right. Whew. We're almost there, guys. Hang in there. I promise. Get up and, like, jump around a little bit. <laughs> yes? Arachnoid. No, it's actually really vascular, and it's sort of like putting a layer of memory foam between the dura and the pia. Does that make sense? No. It's just that extra layer of um, squishy uh, softness, and it's super vascular. And then later on, we'll learn that that's where CSF is actually formed and circulated. So the arachnoid's purpose is more of not just it's not like the dura that has a tough outer protection. It's more of a nutritional supportive type of protection because it's making CSF, right? I know. It's like, what's the purpose if you can't even see it? Well, it's, it's creating CSF and it's filtering it. And so it, it serves a purpose in a different way. Not so much of like structural protection, but more of vascular and that, yeah, yeah. Okay. But that's a really good question. Okay. Y'all ready to talk about spinal nerves? We're almost there, I promise. We have like two or three slides and we're done. Okay, so remember the spinal cord had nerves coming out on either side in between each and every vertebrae. Okay, those are called spinal nerves. And they are going to connect your central nervous system to everything else to your receptors, your muscles, your glands, every part of your body. That is your connection, right? There's nothing else going in or out to the spinal cord and the brain other than your spinal nerves. There's 31 pairs of spinal nerves and they are in the same regions as your vertebrae. So you have cervical, spinal nerves, you have thoracic spinal nerves, you have lumbar spinal nerves, and then you have one pair of coccygeal spinal nerves. They are made up of those anterior and posterior roots that come off of the spinal cord. I just pointed those out to you when we were looking at the cross section of the spinal cord. Okay. I probably need to move this one somewhere else. I feel like the slide is out of place. But remember when we did this in lab, we said every single neuron is covered in endomerium. Remember that? And then they're all combined in fascicles that are bound in perineurium. And then several fascicles are bound in epineurium. That is your spinal nerve, okay? That's what a spinal nerve is, okay? And that's a cool picture over there. So we don't have to worry about this too much because we already know this, right? Okay, so I, think, I feel like you guys hate it when I bring up something we've already done and you're like, we took that test, ladies, stop. We don't need to know this anymore. You do need to know it, okay? Do not put stuff out of your head. It all builds on top of each other. Okay, now, so we know that here's your spinal cord right here. And that coming off of that spinal cord, there's an anterior root and there's a posterior root. And the two join to give you a spinal nerve, right? After you create that spinal nerve, it is going to split again into anterior and posterior. The posterior one is going to go to the back and it's going to supply all the stuff in the back of your body. When I say back, I mean behind the vertebrae, behind the vertebral column, behind your spine, okay? Imagine what's behind your spine. We got some muscles, we got some fat, we got some skin. Do I have any organs back there? No, not really. Okay. The anterior one, this is big guy right here, the anterior ramus is going to supply everything in front of your spine. What do you have in front of your spine? Everything else. Lots of organs, right? 
lots of muscle, lots of tissues, lots of skin, everything on that side. So the anterior ramus is obviously huge in comparison to the posterior one because the posterior doesn't have to cover very much, but the anterior covers everything else, okay? So if you can just remember that you have, in making of a spinal nerve, I'll put it up here, you have roots, right? And the roots will combine, anterior and posterior will combine to give you your spinal nerve. And then that spinal nerve will split into anterior and posterior rami, or a ramus. Ramus is singular, rami is plural. The posterior one supplies what's behind the spine. You got some muscles and skin. The anterior one is going to supply everything that's anterior to that. Okay. And there's that cross section of it. Let's look at those spinal nerves now. I know. So not only is there a pair of spinal nerves that come out at every level between each and every vertebrae. Some of them will actually mix with each other and share things with each other. They'll split, they'll, you know, pass neurons or nerves back and forth to each other. Um, and when they communicate like that, we call that a plexus. So a plexus is a network of um, spinal nerves that all work together to cover a certain organ or body part or region. That's called a plexus. And it's super cool because we'll learn later on that this is the reason we have something called dermatomes. And we'll talk about dermatomes, but I did I took it out of here and put it at the end because I felt like maybe you'd understand it better at the end. But what a dermatome is, is when you have pain in a certain area that has nothing to do with that spot, but simply because they're both from the same plexus. What does that mean? Most people know that when you get pain in your left shoulder, you worry about your heart, right? The reason is the nerves that cover the skin of your shoulder also innervate. They're part of the same plexus that covers your heart. So trouble in one spot can cause pain in the other. That's the whole idea behind this, you know, sharing or network of, of nerves. But I left the dermatomes. We'll talk about those at the end because I didn't want to. We'll talk about them on Thursday. I didn't want to make it too confusing today. But, um, but that's what a plexus is. And these plexi are named according to the area. So we do have a cervical plexus up high. We have a brachial plexus. We have a lumbar plexus. We have a sacral plexus, and these are all the nerves that are involved in this network or these plexi. Um, so if you look up here, you can really see how, do you notice how these, this group right here, that's your brachial plexus. Notice how they come out and then they start going back and forth and mixing, almost making like a little mesh or network of nerves. That's what a plexus is. Compare that to what's happening here. You notice here, each nerve just kind of comes out and goes. There's no mixing. No one's going to visit their neighbor or cross over, you know, to anybody else. Yes. Yeah. So notice here you have just thoracic nerves coming out. They're not connecting. Okay. So, and it kind of makes sense, and I'll tell you why in a minute. So you have a cervical plexus up here. Your cervical nerves are all intertwining and mixing, right? You have a brachial plexus right there where they're all intertwining and mixing. You have a lumbar plexus in the lower back here. They're mixing again. And then a sacral plexus right over here. So let's talk about why we might need a plexus, okay? There are, um, and we don't have one in thoracic nerves. Thoracic nerves are just coming out and going straight out. So. What's in our chest? We've got lungs and a heart, right? Those are controlled by higher centers because they're way too important for just the spinal nerve. Okay, so there's maybe some skin and some muscle, nothing big. The cervical plexus, that's covering your eyes, your, um, your face, 
You've got a lot of facial expressions. You have a lot of detailed motions. You have a lot of important stuff over here in your head and neck, right? So we do need to network. Your brachial plexus is not only going to cover part of your neck, but it's going to cover your arms too. We have to be able to write. We have to be able to move our fingers and do all sorts of cool stuff with our hands. Same thing for your lumbar plexus, right? Because you've got organs in your abdomen. You've got, um, you know, legs that need to move and stuff. Your sacral plexus, you have uh, reproductive organs that need to be covered. So you'll find that most of the plexi, and this is not something that I, I would test you on. It's just something that I use to explain it. The plexi are going to be found in areas that you actually have a lot going on, right? So thoracic, we got some, you know, muscles and skin. There's not too much, too complicated um, that needs a lot of innervation. You'll also notice that there are two areas of enlargement. I'm going to go for a different color here. Actually, I'm going to erase that. There are two areas of that spinal cord. When you look at it, they're a little bit more enlarged than the rest of it. There's a cervical enlargement right here in the neck. And there is a lumbar enlargement right here in the lower back. Again, up here, I'm covering some extra limbs, right? In the lower back, I'm covering my lower limbs. So you've got a little bit larger part of the spinal cord there. Um, and then you get to the very last part of the spinal cord. That is this right here. That is the conus medullaris. And after that, you just have those free spinal nerves that all together we call the cauda equina. Does that make sense? Yes? All right. Any questions on any of that? No? Really? Cool. So um, when we get back on Thursday, we're going to break down those plexi. We're going to go through each one and talk about some important things. Um, like we'll look at the cervical plexus and what nerves are involved in it, um, what it does, what it innervates. Um, we'll talk about the brachial plexus and some of the injuries to the brachial plexus, and those are super important. You will have to know those injuries. Like if you injure the median nerve, what does it cause? If you injure a radial nerve, what is that injury going to uh, result in? But well, we will do those on Thursday.